Am I on mute or on mute? I can't work it out. Thank you, Chair. We're now live. Chair, would you like to unmute? Can, can, Thank you, I've Chair. Done, I've done. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I'll take that as a yes. Thank you. Welcome to the um, meeting of the Health Scrutiny Panel on Tuesday, the 19th of January. Um, I'd like to open the meeting with um, agenda number one. I apologise for absence. And we only have one. That's Councillor Philip Story. Um, declarations of interest. I haven't had any so far. Caroline hasn't had any. So I'll take that as, as a no. Agenda item three. The minutes of the Health Scrutiny meeting held on the 10th of November. Does that everybody agree that, that those are true and correct? Great. Thank All of them, Chair. Thank Great, you. Chair. Thank you. Um, agenda item number four, the COVID-19 update. Mark, I think you're here somewhere. Where are you? Can I hand over to you, Mark, please? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, thank you. As if by magic, there's the, there's the presentation. So, so the um, just to go through the, through the um, data uh, in terms of where we're at with COVID, if you could move on to the next slide, slide please. Um, so this is the regional picture. You can see the the uh, right hand um, sort of pair of columns before the green column is the rate for the previous seven day period up to the 8th of January. And the, the first two columns are the current rate up to the 15th of January. Um, and you can see it's dropping in all areas. The green is, is a reduction in rate. Um, oh, there's a big grey square. Oh, back again. Um, so it's reducing in all areas, although, as you'll see, the Middlesbrough um, rates are levelling leveling off and, in, in fact, um, ticking up a little bit uh, as well. But compared, so so the rates in, in all of the northeast are lower than they were, but still high. Uh, but not as high as those on the right, which are largely in the southeast. Nosley's um, near Liverpool, I think, isn't it? The rest of them are in the um, southeast, with very, very high rates. Uh, if you could move on to the next slide, please. So you can see the um, the, the 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 lowest um, point, uh, unsurprisingly, on Christmas Day um, is the sort of mid to the left of the of this graph, and then the first peak, I think is those that were infected from mixing on Christmas Day. The second peak at 173 cases on that day, the 4th of January, I think is people mixing on New Year's Eve and possibly also some um, reinfection of uh, family members within the household from the original infection from Christmas Day. And then the sort of third peak, which is spread over from the kind of 11th through to the 16th of January, with those very high numbers that don't don't look that high because the scales got so high to to accommodate the 170 plus the days where there was 170 plus um, cases um, is probably the most worrying of that uh, of that effect because that was dropping down to the 9th of January and is now picking up again over quite a quite a few days of of more than 100 um, cases so that's that's what's concerning us at the moment it appears to be dropping off a little bit again whether that's different waves of transmission within households or another kind of event um, similar to Christmas Day and New Year's Eve, we're, we're trying to work through what's causing that um, shape, which doesn't seem to be replicated in other areas across the northeast at the moment. Um, but we do know that the the rates of the COVID variant are higher in Middlesbrough than they are in other areas. It's around about 75% of cases in Middlesbrough okay. are, are COVID variant. And and rest of the northeast around about is over 60% in most areas. So it's not that much higher, but it is higher. Um, next slide, please. So this is this is the rolling seven day rate. So you can see we, we reached the peak um, uh, from following the Christmas period at the at the at the third fourth of January, and it's it's dropping off slowly. And then from the thirteenth of January, leveling leveling off, or even a slight uptick, which is very worrying, at around about the same sort of level that we started getting worried in mid November as our previous peak. So we're kind of fallen and leveling off at what was previously a very worrying peak where we were looking at, I think it was tier three um, restrictions at that time. Next slide, please. So this is looking at it by age rate. So the um, red uh, line is the younger working age, so 20 to 39 year olds. The grey line is the, the, the sort of next chunk of working age, if you like, from 40 to 59, uh, accepting that people obviously work over, over 60 as well. And then the, the, the over 60 rates is largely driven by um, 
care home testing. Um, so there's there's around about 30 or so that have been tested positive in, in care homes. Not all who are symptomatic. I don't have a breakdown of asymptomatic to, to, to um, symptomatic um, cases. Uh, and a number of those will be from hospital testing, which I, I don't have that breakdown at the moment yet either, but we will get that. And then the naught to 19s are um, lower than, than, than the rest, um, as we've seen all the way through. Uh, next slide, please. So this is this is I think I said, probably said the last uh, the last time this is the most worrying uh, slide of of all of them. So this is the um, inpatients in South Tees. So it's it's doubled in the last two weeks. It's over. It's um, around about two hundred and twenty uh, inpatients at the moment, and the the orange uh, bar at the bottom is. Uh, new admissions or diagnosis of COVID. Um, so you can see that the, the the higher bars now up to nearly 50 a day on the 12th and 13th of January, which which will have started to be picking up those that were that were infected on Christmas Day around about that time. So we're starting to see the uh, so so up until that point was was um, people infected in the community pre Christmas pretty much, and then from there I'd expect to see this increase further. The modelling at James Cook suggests it might peak at 300. Um, in patients uh, and the significance of that is not only obviously people ill in hospital with COVID and the number of uh, ventilated patients or patients on oxygen is increasing as well but also there's there's a sort of crowding out effect of those patients coming in and other people that are ill and need hospital care obviously it's more difficult for them to access that with COVID patients so not only the numbers of patients but also that, that they need to be nursed and cared for in, in a more distant way so there's less patients able to to fit into a ward because of that distancing those yeah. distancing requirements yeah. and i think that's the final slide yeah that's the final one mark yeah I mean, and you'll notice on there there's no there's no details of um vaccination um rates um but uh we we are starting to get details through of vaccination rates but at the moment we're not allowed to share them so i'm not allowed to tell you that the last time i looked there was um, more than 8,000 people in Middlesbrough were vaccinated uh, and uh, um, just around about half of the over 80s as of the back end of last week uh, vaccinated, but I'm not allowed to say that, so I haven't told you that. So that's that's the end of my presentation. Craig might be able to give more details on the vaccine. I think I think uh, there's a nervousness about differential rates of vaccination across the country. Um, but I think the shorthand for vaccination, and Craig might be able to give more detail on this, is that, um, th that we're doing really well in this area for vaccinations. I get quite a lot of queries about, um, you know, somebody in this bit of Middlesbrough is over 70 and they've been called for their vaccinations and we haven't yet and we're in this bit of Middlesbrough. So that depending on which wave of the primary care network is going, the, the, there's slight differentials in terms of which um, of the Joint Committee on Vaccination priority groups are called, but it's only a difference of a number of days. Um, but the but the primary care networks and James Cook have done a fantastic job in terms of the numbers they've got through for the first uh, vaccination. Um, and hopefully by the next time we meet, we'll be able to share more more detailed information on the vaccination effort in Middlesbrough. Um, Mark, before we hand over to you, sorry, can you hear me all right? Yep. Yeah. Before I hand over to Craig, there's just a couple of um, questions I want to make uh, and uh, a point I want to make. And obviously, if you'll, if you'll allow... Um, others to um, speak. I th think Alma might might want to. Um, the the graphs certainly indicate. Without, uh, I'll just write some names down before I kick off. Otherwise, I forget. David, sorry, Councillor Coop and Councillor Rooney. Nobody else. I forgot. Oh, sorry. Who's that? Uh, Brian. Sorry, uh, Councillor. Sorry, it's a bit dark, Councillor, but I couldn't really see. Are you short of light bulbs in your house? <laughs> right. Um, um, yeah, the graphs the gra graphs clearly indicate that um, isolation is the key. Apart from the masks, isolation is the key because it's obvious that you know, round about Christmas, round about New Year, when people mix, it's gone absolutely shoot up. So all these people that you see on social media and everywhere else saying, "No, it's ridiculous." You know, we can meet, and and it's wrong to uh, for the police to arrest people and find people. It's absolutely adamant that we do isolate. Otherwise. You know, we were saying at the beginning of this meeting how aw awkward it is having these virtual meetings. Not, not the same, it's nowhere near the same as, you know, when we're in the council chamber. Um, God forbid we should carry on like this. And we will have to. And lots of people will be 
inconvenienced and you know lose hours at work if we don't get a grip on this and we'll only get a grip on it if we do as we're told and isolate wherever possible um i'm, I'm glad you've seen the, the the graphs because i didn't think it would be as bad as that and i'm sure possibly other, other people here at the meeting would agree with me i had no idea but it would be as bad as that at those particular times and the second question i was about yeah the the, the variant was much worse here in, in middlesbrough i know it's a stupid question but i'm going to ask it anyway have you any idea why that could possibly be, please? I have no idea why that would be. It seems right. to be uh, Middlesbrough and Redcar are, are the two higher areas in the northeast, which would suggest it's making a literal geographic move up the country. But I don't, I, I, you know, that's just because of the coincidence that they happen to be the two southernmost bits of the northeast have got higher rates. I, I, I think it's probably just chance as much as anything else. And congratulations must be in order for the figure of um, the number of people immunised, as we call it, vaccinated. Um, yeah. You've done very, very well. So I think, um, Councillor Coop, you were next. You had your hand up first. Would you like to ask your question? So I can get this thing to work. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, Mark, just looking at the figures on the Middlesex Council website today, I noticed that the average has crept up to 480. Just it's a slight peak, but the fact that it is peaked at all, um, just found that a little bit worrying. Um, it does give the figures there on, on the public side of the council website. Do, do, you, do you look at that as a problem or is it just a temporary glitch? No, I think it's a problem. I think, I think the problem is the uh, hospital and, and how it impacts on the hospital. I think when I was worried when uh, we had the peak after Christmas and then the peak after New Year's Eve, and then, but, but reasonably comforted that it was dropping off, the fact it's picking up again um, is, is really concerning because um, the hospital is already um, um, got a lot of COVID patients. And as we talked about before, that, that sort of crowding out of other people needing care. Um, and, and the hospital will cope because that's that's how they work. But um, the implications of that and the impact of that of other people needing care um, could be significant for, for the months and years to come. So um, whatever we, the, the difficulty is the action that we can take. We, we already contact all those positive cases um, that, that have been, that have tested positive. We all, we've already got a, an enhanced financial offer to support people to isolate. We've already got the virtual ward that supports um, older people that might become ill. So we've, we've kind of got in place all the things that we could have in place, I think. Um, uh, and, and really, it's just a question of waiting for it to make its way through and hopefully not impact too much on the hospital. But my concern is that it will do. And, we, and we're starting to see that with that rapid rise up from um, between Christmas and New Year when the cases started rising up. And I think before Christmas, I was concerned that we hadn't got the numbers down far enough because we, we knew that this was going to happen post Christmas. Um, and I think that's playing out. Um, I don't know if, if, if Craig's got any more details in terms of the hospitals um, because because they've got contingency plans to be able to make space for additional COVID patients, but it's not it's it doesn't come without its cost in terms of other people not being able to access care. I don't know, Craig, if you if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I will cover some of that in um, in my presentation as well. All right, okay, sorry. I, I think it's, it's it's probably fair to say now that we're at a point where anything, any routine activities, any routine surgeries have been um, suspended. And the only work that's continuing within the hospital environment now is responding to COVID and those um, clinically urgent patients that need some kind of treatment. So that would probably be your, your cancer surgeries that are continuing to take place. All of the capacity, all of the available capacity has been turned over to support COVID patients and expansion of critical care capacity. And that would include some of the theatres, some of the recovery areas, and obviously the staff that would have been associated with that providing support to those patients as well. So it really is um, a, a tight position at the moment in the hospital trusts. And we've certainly got one hospital within the Tees Valley that's rapidly approaching around 50% occupancy of COVID patients. So that kind of shows the um, the scale of the, the challenge that we're currently facing. Thank you. Just one last other comment. I, I have actually seen the figures for yesterday, which I'm not allowed to repeat, but I think you're right. It is heading up very seriously at, at um, in the South Tees. Um, you, we were told before 300. It's going to could well peak up to. Um, are you worried it may go beyond that peak? And I'm sure we can cope, but it just means nothing will happen other than COVID, and that's not a good thing for the town. Not a good thing for anywhere. 
Mm-hmm. I think just in terms of the hospital numbers, that some of the work that's been happening within South Tees Trust to model where they think there will be, what numbers are expected to come in on a on a day by day and a week by week basis, they've been pretty good in terms of the modelling work that they've undertaken and they're anticipating that by the end of this week they should have hit their peak as long as people continue to adhere to social distancing staying at home full of the messages um, we should start to see that the peak achieved at the end of this week and then hopefully things will start to improve from there today the the trusts are around 220 just over 220 patients uh, with covid in hospital beds so we're, we're some way off the the 300 mark um, I think it would be incredibly difficult to maintain any kind of surgical program if we approach the 300 beds. Even the key priority um, surgeries would need to be cancelled at that point to accommodate um, additional COVID patients. So hopefully we are approaching that peak. People will continue to follow the messages, stay at home, stay safe, and we'll be able to avoid the hospital becoming overwhelmed. Councillor Rooney, Councillor Rooney, you had a question. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, it, I mean, it's really around the same issue. Is this rise possibly a result of the children going back to school for one day, or do we not think that that's going to figure at all? Thank you. I mean, you can't answer any of these with complete certainty, but I, I don't think that's the case. We are seeing a number of cases in school. Obviously, there's, there's, there's a reduced number of children back into school, um, but it's more likely they they brought it into school from outside than 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 within than it was transmitted within school. So I, I don't I don't think that that's contributing to it. We know that more children are back in school than they were through the original lockdown, but um, I, I don't see that as a as a a, a big contributing factor. It might have a small effect, but I don't, I don't think it's it's causing those numbers. Councillor Hubbard, you are, sorry, I'm sorry, 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 Councillor Rooney, I didn't realise you'd finished. Go ahead. No, I was just saying thank you. Thanks. Can I just ask, are any of the officers unmuting me because something's going wrong with my with my um, microphone. Chair, I'm I'm unable to hear you. Can you try again, please? It appears that you're you're on mute now, Councillor. Yes, Chair. Are you all right now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. There's just a can we we come to an arrangement that I I unmute myself. I mute it. I unmute it. That's it, otherwise we're contradicting each other. Fine. Right, <laughs> Councillor Hubbard, you wanted to ask a question. Thank you, Chair. On uh, yesterday's North East News, they stated that all the care homes in Newcastle had been done. Do we have a figure for Middlesbrough? Thank you. Uh, I don't. Ha- I don't have a figure of of what proportion have been done. I know at the weekend there was there was a um, a large number of care homes covered, and this next weekend I think they're due to all be covered by the twenty fourth of of January. Um, and as I understand it, we're on track. Or well, I say we. They're on track to, um, to to deliver that. Craig, I don't know if you've got any any more detailed yeah. information. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. By by this Sunday, we will have all of our care homes, care home staff, and residents covered, and um, that's everybody will have been offered um, a, a vaccination, and those who've accepted will have received the vaccination. Now, obviously, there may be some individuals that choose not not to have it, and we can't we can't. Um, we can't avoid that, unfortunately, but the offer will have been made. And if, if you want to receive it, that should have happened by this Sunday. And we are well on track to deliver that. We've made good progress with it. Councillor Watson, you want to ask a question? Yes, Chair. On the numbers of uh, those who decline the vaccination, are we made aware of that number? Thank you. Uh, we don't get those details. We had a conversation, um, Lisa, uh, who's on this call, uh, and myself met with Vishali Nanda, who's the clinical director of Central Middlesbrough Primary Care Network, is starting to look at how we can share data from the from the primary care network so that we can understand um, the impact on inequalities and ensure that all communities, um, both geographical communities and, for example, BME communities, are covered. Um, and obviously, um, We'll, we'll look to develop that through the through the primary care networks and through the CCG, so we can um, fulfil that bit of our responsibility. Um, but I don't have details at the moment of of those that have refused the vaccine. I don't know if you do, Craig. No, we we don't have any hard and fast numbers, Mark. We you know we we picked up some um, soft intelligence, and and that predominantly come from the hospital site. 
and uh, the feedback is that there's very very few people who've actually refused to date or declined the offer uh, but obviously that that doesn't mean that will be repeated out in the community when the primary care networks are working with uh, the broader population mark can i ask you a question please you might not know the answer but then again you might do you think we could ever reach a stage where um it's the law that someone has um, a vaccination they have to have it by law i think that's unlikely I, i'm not aware of anywhere that has that stipulation um, I think I think we need to work with communities to to try to kind of offset the the I think they call them vaccine hesitant um, and work to um, to ch to uh, sort of remove some of the uh, false stories that are going around and you have seen on the news some of the work through the mosques and various others where there's specific um, uh, um, falsehoods I guess um, targeting BME communities about the, what's in and what's not in the vaccines and all that kind of stuff so we just need to do good old-fashioned community development work to work with our communities to ensure that um, if somebody does refuse the vaccine they're refusing it based on correct information and that's their choice as a as a free individual and that we minimize that number down to as low as as we possibly can I, don't, I, I can't see a point where it's going to be mandated that you have to have it mm, thank you um, Alma do you not have any questions none at all okay fine. As usual, but thank you not for now anyway thank you <laughs> okay. Um, then we can go to um, agenda item five, health and wealth and introduction. So sorry, so, sorry, 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 Chair. Can I just come in there? Craig was yes. just going to give the other part of this presentation. Oh, sorry, in terms Craig. Of the health sorry. Information. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry, Craig. Because you were speaking, I'm sorry, Chair. Because you you'd already spoken, I assumed yeah, no, you didn't no, have no, any more to say. Sorry. No problem. I um. I provided a, a short presentation really giving some updates on some key activities that the nhs have been undertaking since we last spoke um so if we can move on to the next slide caroline to explain really i was hoping to give a bit of an the vaccination program and talk a little bit about um post oximetry at home where we are with hospital capacity in response to the covid surge including some detail around how we're working differently with the independent sector and then some priorities for the remainder of this financial year, which takes us through to the end of March, just to give um, to give the committee really a feel for what's happening within the NHS and how we're responding. Uh, and happy to take any questions. I've put a, put a bit of a pause in after each section. So if anybody's got any questions, I'm more than happy to take them as we work through if that works. I have, I have straight away, Craig. Yeah. For the ignorant, what is pulse oximetry, please? Yeah, pulse oximetry is... A is it something just simple like taking somebody's pulse at home? It, it, it's along those lines, yes. It's measuring um, oxygen levels in, in people's bloods to make sure that their um, their lungs are, are functioning properly. So it's a it's a, a tool that um, that I'll talk a little bit more about as we work through the presentation, but a way of remotely okay. monitoring people so that we can support them in their own home rather than keeping them in hospital beds. Thank you. No problem. So if we could move to the next slide, um, and again, if we can move forward, this is just to introduce the vaccination programme. So a uh, bit of an overview, the vaccination programme that we've currently began rolling out is based around four, four key um, ways of, of getting the vaccine out there. Uh, large scale vaccination services, which uh, locally within the northeast, uh, the nearest one is in Newcastle at the Centre for Life. You've probably seen some publicity about that on the local news. Uh, we've got the local vaccination service, which has been delivered by what we refer to as PCNs, the primary care networks. And across the Tees Valley, we've got 13 of those. And um, we've also got the hospital vaccination service and then local pharmacy vaccination services. Now, at the moment, we don't have any pharmacies delivering the vaccine within the Tees Valley, but we're currently working on plans to try and mobilise two sites in the very near future, hopefully from next week one of which uh, we're hopeful will be in the Middlesbrough locality. So um, we'll provide further information and some communications once that happens, but we're not quite ready yet um, to, to take those forward. Caroline, if we just flip forward, um, just in terms of who would get the vaccine, um, obviously there's been lots of talk around the priority groups. I thought it was probably useful just to pop down on a slide so that everybody's aware of who the priority groups are and how we would like to go about um, targeting those groups so obviously a um, couple of different cohorts of patients and those in the first cohort are uh, residents in care homes uh, those are over 80 year old and those 75 years of age um, who are classed as vulnerable we're trying to target first so that's the group we're working through currently and as you'll have already heard there's been some really good progress made 
unfortunately from a, a CCG perspective, I'm not able to confirm the numbers because unlike Mark, I don't actually have access to them yet. Uh, they haven't been shared with some parts of the health system, but they have been shared uh, embargoed with some of our colleagues in public health. Hence the reason that Mark's, Mark's got some of those figures. Um, what I can tell you though, is that we're making great progress with mobilizing the primary care site and the hospital themselves are making really good progress in terms of vaccinating all health and care staff. Um, so we know that the vast majority of staff who work at the James Cook Hospital have now been vaccinated and they've made great progress in supporting care home staff who also require the vaccination. Uh, and at the last check, there was over two and a half thousand care home staff that had either, either received the vaccination or were booked in to have it. That was up to the end of last week. So that's a real positive. Uh, again, Caroline, if we could just flip forward. Thank you. So the, the hospital vaccination service, um, that's been delivered from, from three of the hospitals in the Tees Valley. So South Tees Hospital via James Cook, North Tees and Hartlepool Foundation Trust, just north of the river, and then County Dunham and Darlington Foundation Trust as well. Uh, their primary focus is on supporting inpatients, so that's patients who are in hospital beds that meet the criteria for the vulnerable groups, health service staff, which we've just touched on, and care workers, including care home staff. And there's currently a, a significant piece of work underway linked in with the directors of adult social services to coordinate care staff who also need the vaccine. So not just staff working within a care home, but social workers and anybody else that's um, supporting, keeping people at home, keeping people well, um, and maintaining well-being in the community. So that works ongoing and we expect those lists to be filtered through to the Foundation Trust in the very near future so that those vaccinations can, can be undertaken. And indeed, some of those have started this week. Uh, if we could can, can, I, can, I ask, can I ask you a question, please, yeah, uh, Craig? When you say, um, uh, you know, the level, the, you know, you, the, the people who are going to be vaccinated, down, 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 down. Um, will that include, you know, people who are simply... Um, delivering medication from chemist to to, to a resident. Um, yes. Obviously, they're helping that resident stay at home. Would they be Would they uh, be vaccinated as well? Would they, so they um, would be, be included? As, they would be classed as um, support care support workers, and there is a, a very clear definition around those who will and won't be. But my understanding is, yes, they would be. They would be covered if they're expected to go into into people's homes to provide support. Then they'd be covered as a as a support worker. Uh, and they'd be included in the lists that are being collated at the moment. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so if we could move on, yep. Our primary care network designated sites. So as I've, as I've mentioned, there are 13 sites across the Tees Valley, a number of which are in Middlesbrough and Redcar and Cleveland. Um, all of our sites are now live. We did roll out in various waves, some of which started prior to December, um, but all of which went live last week. Any sites that went live before the 30th December only received the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. So that was the one that was um, originally particular um, core chain. So there was some complications around making sure it was uh, moved appropriately. Since then, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines come online. And from the 4th of January, we've been distributing that to um, practices as well. And that's what they've been using to get out to the care homes and um, support care home staff and residents. At the moment, the way the vaccine supplied is based on a push model. So rather than our primary care networks order the vaccine and pull it down, the vaccine is allocated to them on a central basis. Um, so we don't actually have any control over how much vaccine we order and therefore how much we can actually get out into the communities. And as I previously touched on, uh, the CCG doesn't have any access to the numbers at the moment around how many vaccines have been delivered. Um, we do keep a track of how many vaccines or how many vials of the vaccine have been supplied. And at the moment, we're at, we're at a stage where there's about 53,000 doses worth of the vaccine have been supplied, uh, but we can't directly translate that into vaccines being given, uh, predominantly because um, there will be some, some wastage um, out of the, the vials that are supplied and there has been some change in the number of doses that can be distributed from an individual vial. Uh, original guidance was that there could be five, but uh, that's now moved to the, there's potentially six doses in each vial. Um, but it does give you a round benchmark of, of where we, we could possibly be based on what's been supplied. Craig, can I ask you a yes. question? Are we now only using the Oxford vaccine or are we using both? 
No, we're, we're still using both. Um, I think whilst there are still supplies or whilst supplies are being made available of both, then they are both being used. And actually there is a third vaccine that's been approved, the Moderna vaccine, um, which would come online later in the year that would also supplement the supplies that we're currently getting. Thank you. No problem. If we could move on again, if that's possible. Thank you. So just in terms of um, Middlesbrough and the, the Middlesbrough designated sites, uh, I thought it was, it was worth sharing that detail given uh, we are Middlesbrough scrutiny today. So um, this, the details of the sites and the primary care um, networks, the practices that are within those groupings is, is detailed there. The go live dates for the sites were 21st of December for Holgate and Greater Middlesbrough and uh, Central Middlesbrough came online in January, early January last week. So um, we are both live now. Nothing further really to add on that. So if we're okay to move on. Craig, can I just, sorry, can I just ask you, um, um, the hard to reach people, people who don't have, um, don't buy a gazette or don't have internet access, how are we accessing those to tell them where they can go for a vaccine, please? Yep, so um, all, all patients are being contacted by their practices, so if, um, if they're not con contactable electronically, they will receive a letter calling them for, for their vaccine. Every single, every individual over a certain age? Yes, so in terms of um, the programmes being rolled out in line with the priority groups that I shared on the slide earlier on, and as we mm. went through each of those priority groups, they'll be contacted in turn. So starting with the most clinically vulnerable and then working through, well, I think the, the last one on the list there was the over 50s uh, in mm. this current, current wave of the programme. And we do have a small minority of people who can't read, don't we? Yes, Believe that's it. Yes, that, 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 yes that, that is correct. And I'll need to check what the arrangements are for those who um, need support with, with reading. I know that there is a, a specific um, programme of work as well, looking at those those homeless uh, members of our community and how they access uh, the vaccine as well. I don't mean I don't mean that the people who are illiterate. Uh, well, I, obviously I do, some, some can't read, but there's also people who are blind and partially sighted. Yep. Are we making yep. arrangements for them? Yeah, I mean, trad traditionally we would provide um, communication for th for those groups in in Braille and other formats. So I'll need to go back and double check. I would expect that's the case, but I can't confirm that at the moment. No, no. So I'll, I'll look into that and confirm. That's that. fine. Thank you. Thank you. No Chair, can I just interrupt there? I believe Councillor Denise Rooney has a question. We can't see. I'm sorry, I can't see her face because I, I, we've got the slide online. Sorry, Councillor Rooney, I can't. I can't see anybody's face. So I'm relying on um, uh, officers to. Uh, to flag it up. Okay, thank you. Um, just going back to that previous slide, um, Craig, the the list of GP practices, is that all of the GP practices in Middlesbrough or not? Yes, that's you know why I'm going to ask because my, <laughs> to carry in an interest, my GP practice isn't on there and it is a Middlesbrough practice. So I'm surprised that's not on there. It could just be the format in of this the slide councillor Rooney really. so that might just be an error on my part when I try to cram the long list onto one slide um, all of the practices in Middlesbrough are covered by primary care network so your practice will um, will be on there somewhere it could just be the way I've, um, I've presented it if you want to catch me outside the meeting let me know the name of your practice and I'll confirm which network it sits within for you all right, because it is in, you know, it's in a built-up area, so it's not just me. That yeah, the not every, Thank you. This is allowed to a primary care network, um, and we've been, been doing that with all the practices, so they are clear which one they're in, and they've been in that for, for some time now. So apologies if I've managed to cut a couple off when I try to slide onto one, uh, one page. Mm -hmm. Chair, I believe Councillor Cooper also has a question. Thank you. Okay. Off you go, Councillor Cooper. I'm sorry I can't see because of the presentation. It's all right, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that the GPs uh, handled the flu vaccination brilliantly. It was like a military operation. You attended well in advance. Um, you had a, a text message well in advance telling you when to go, where to go, how to go. You went in the front door, you got your jab in the middle, and you went out the back door, and it worked brilliantly. Now, I've noticed on the screen when you've been putting up the uh, the various contact points that my GPs was on there, but this time around for the vaccine, we've had nothing, no information whatsoever. The only information I have is uh, I know people have come from Darlington across to James Cove, and people have gone from Middlesbrough to the One Life in Newcastle. 
Uh, so I'm wondering why there seems to be some difficulty with the vaccine compared to how the uh, flu jab was dealt with so um, professionally. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Councillor. So I'll, I'll try and respond. I mean, I think the um, the way that we're trying to work through at the moment, only those patients who have been called are receiving any correspondence. So there isn't any blanket correspondence going out to everybody um, until your cohort, your particular wave, has been called forward. In terms of the sites that are being offered, um, it, it's it's purely being offered on a, a needs basis. So those with the greatest need are being called first to those facilities where the vaccine is available. Now we do have the vaccine available in all of our PCNs now. So the PCN sites, the designated sites are all receiving supplies. So hopefully um, people will be able to access the, the vaccination at a local site to them. Uh, I'm conscious that there are some individuals being called to the Centre for Life in Newcastle and that's purely because there's an available vaccine there and there's the opportunity to go and have it potentially earlier than you would have otherwise got it if you were waiting for your local primary care network to call you forward. Um, but clearly if there, are, if there are difficulties for individuals in terms of getting to any of the facilities they're being called to, I think if we, if we can have a conversation with them and we can look at what, what the alternatives are. Are you, you. are you happy with that, Councillor Cooper? Yes, Chair, thank you. Okay. Do you want to carry on, Craig? Yeah, if that's okay, brilliant. So um, I was going to give a bit of an update around the COVID oximetry at home. Um, I'm conscious that Dr Janet Walker has previously been along to the committee and, and talked about the service. And it was just to really give a, a bit of an update, uh, given that there's been some agreement between health and social care partners to provide some additional funding to expand the capacity of the service. So if we're okay to move on to the next slide, just a, a bit of a reminder, what, what is on the public oximetry at home? Well, it's, it's in, in simple terms, a way of supporting healthcare professionals to monitor patients while they're in their own homes for up to 14 days. Uh, we use pulse oximeters, which are a small device that clicks up to the end of your finger. And there's a little picture of one in the top corner of the, the slide there. That can, um, ah. yeah, that can monitor your oxygen level. And if your oxygen levels drop, that can provide an early warning so we can um, make an intervention so we can get a team to come out and where you all can provide some advice over the phone. Uh, in terms of what we hope to achieve through this service, well, hopefully we'll help support more people stay well, stay at home and keep them out of hospital, protect some of the hospital capacity that we talked about earlier today. Um, patients are monitored remotely by a clinical team. So, you know, we've got doctors and nurses providing support. Uh, and if there are any confirmed indications that their condition's declining, then we can either provide that support remotely to them, or we can look to um, have them admitted to hospital if, if that absolutely is necessary. Okay, if we're okay, move on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the, the virtual ward itself, how does it work? Well, we're focusing on working with two groups of patients, two cohorts, uh, those who are aged over 65 years old and have been in hospital or diagnosed with COVID and have symptoms. The second group is those that are under 65 years old, have had a COVID diagnosis and are sym symptomatic or they're clinically vulnerable. So our clinically vulnerable patients will be those who currently receiving treatment for cancers, have long-term conditions, uh, they may be immunosuppressed. Uh, it makes them more vulnerable to um, the impact of COVID. Uh, we're also looking at those with BMI greater than 35 and individuals from the BAME population who are more vulnerable to the impact of COVID as well. If we Craig, can I ask you, um, if you just, just go back, can you just go back to the previous slide? The um, people with a learning disability, um, starting at what age, Craig, please? Uh, that is a great question, and I'll need to double check that for you. My understanding is it's adults, so anybody... 18 and, adult, 18 and over. But I'll need to double check that it is 18. So if I can come back to you on that chair. Mm, thank you. Great. No problem. Okay, if we're okay to move on. Yep. So in terms of the impact... Uh, so, so far, the um, the service has been really well received and it's been so well received that we've been able to expand the capacity it can it can take. So at the moment, 
we've been able to move to the ward being able to manage 120 patients at any point in time. And that's been done through support, financial support from our colleagues in, in local authorities working together uh, with health to uh, look at further support in the service. That's been great. It's a service that's delivered across the whole of the Tees Valley, working really closely with our colleagues in the federations. Uh, there, there are currently 108 patients on the ward. We have picked up um, towards 120. There are currently 108 on there at the moment. And there is another service running alongside this, the hospital. Hospital Specialist Virtual Oximetry Ward at James Cook Hospital, which looks after a slightly sicker cohort of patients, helps transfer them from the hospital setting to the home setting. Uh, and there are currently 68 patients being managed through, through that service as well. So together, um, you can see how these two services have really supported creating some capacity in the hospital and keeping more people at home in a managed way which when you look at some of the numbers that Max shared earlier on, uh, those hospital beds are really valuable at the moment and freeing up the uh, clinical time of the professionals who are looking after those individuals has been absolutely key. Okay, so if we're able to move on, I think that is probably the end of that. More than happy to take any questions on that, uh, that section, if that would help. Chair, no? Susie, can I, anybody, can anybody see anybody with a hand up? I have a question, Chair. All right, off you go. Thank you, Chair. Um, just going back to the mix of um, uh, the antivirus um, injections, we started off with the Pfizer um, one, and now we're going on of the AstraZeneca. Are we sure we're keeping back enough quantities, or will they be available for the people who have had the Pfizer or had the second jab? Because I know I'm a member of my ward, which just happened to be in the hospital on the day, he got the first jab. She's had a second jab, but her husband's had the first jab. So are we sure that we're going to have enough of these jabs so that people will get their second jab within three months? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Cook. Yeah. So, in terms of um, monitoring and tracking those individuals that have had the various vaccines, yes, that is that's clearly part of the process that's uh, been implemented. So, uh, there is a record of who's had what, um, so that we can continue to monitor um, supplies availability. So, everybody who's had, so for example, the AstraZeneca injection as their first um, jab, they will get that as their second, and vice versa with the the Pfizer. So, that is that is clearly an expectation uh, that we're working within. And continuing to work with um, with colleagues at a national level to make sure that we, we get the right amounts of vaccine in uh, the various different um, from the various different manufacturers to support with that. Yeah, because I just worried that the Pfizer the factory said they were going to cut production or something to to try and increase it later on. That just concerned me. Can I just ask if anybody wants to ask a question? Because I can't see them because of what's on here. If you could just call out, please, if Susie misses you, if you just call out and then I'll write your names down. Could, could I ask a question, Chair? Yes, I'll, I'll you go. off you go. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, I know this is something that I'd, I'd, I'd emailed Craig about, actually, but I, I just wanted to, sort of wanted to follow up with the committee if I can. Um, I, w I was wondering if there was any progress on a, a, a nasal... Um, spray version of the um, vaccines because I noted that there was a study at Birmingham University that had shown that they could um, deliver it in a nasal spray form and I just wondered, in, I'd, I'd mentioned it in terms of people who have needle phobias or um, when younger people, children need to be vaccinated as well. Um, obviously that it would be quite valuable if it could be delivered in, in a different form just in case it, it meant that it would increase take up and are you aware of any any supplies of a different type of delivery of the vaccine being available, or and is that something that we would want to explore? I'm really sorry, Councillor Story, but that's that's um, way beyond my my area of expertise and knowledge, and I'm not able to to advise whether or not there are any other delivery methods available at the moment. From a from a local um, NHS perspective, we're, we're we're currently working to try and um, support delivery of, of the vaccine in the format it comes in now. So I'm not directly involved in any work or research to, to understand other delivery methods um, or trials that are, that are underway elsewhere. I can certainly go away and look at that. Um, I don't know, Mark may have some, some further intelligence from, from the public health networks 
around what work is and is progressing on that front. But at this time, it's not something I could help with, unfortunately. It's not something I'm aware of either, but I'll, I'll, I'll do the same. And if there is anything that I can get through my networks that is either the same or different to what Craig gets, I'll, I'll uh, let Caroline know for, for distribution to this group. Okay, cheers. Council Story, have you checked the internet? No, is there nothing on there? Oh, well, I, I mean, I did, I did look into it a little bit because there, is, there was a, there was a, a study at Bir Birmingham University, like I said, that had um, uh, put, had put one of the vaccines mm. into a deliverable form through a nasal spray. Um, but I just, I just wanted to know if it was something that, um, it's not obviously, it's not a priority. I mean, people are having the, having the jabs, and that's, that's a key thing. But I, I was just asking in terms of further down the line, really. I'm talking most, more sort of months away, um, yeah. several months away. I would expect before anything like that would come forward. Okay. Just whether yeah. it was valuable. Yes, thank you. Do you want to carry on, Craig? I can't see you anywhere. Yeah, no, that'd be great. So just a um, quick update now in terms of hospital capacity. We, we've touched on some of this already. So uh, the hospitals are under significant pressure at the moment. Uh, they're managing not only COVID surge, but what would be traditional winter surge as well. Although the winter surge has been um, relatively subdued because of um, social distancing, etc., and people staying at home, not getting out and about, which is, is great to hear. Um, the key pressures at the moment are around critical care, and we've touched on the, the pressures there in terms of um, having to surge critical care capacity, uh, use parts of the hospital that otherwise wouldn't be available for critical care, and repurpose staff to provide support to patients who um, are, are currently um, receiving ventilation. So, anaesthetists who otherwise would have been working in surgery, supporting patients to maintain uh, them while they're, they're receiving oxygen. Um, Elective program. The elective program has significantly been scaled back, and just detailed on the slide there, focusing on priority ones and priority twos. They're the most um, clinically urgent patients who require surgery, so things like the cancers. Again, touched on that a little bit earlier as well. Um, repurposing of wards. There's lots of work ongoing within South Tees Hospital at the moment to look at how the wards are used. So Mark touched on the fact that social distancing. Um, need to apply in a hospital setting as well, so there's less beds available in the hospital. We've also got requirements around ensuring that we have parts of the hospital that are kept for non-COVID patients, other parts that are dedicated to COVID patients, and we refer to these um, these COVID areas as red areas, red corridors, red wards. So we've been working with the hospital trust to understand how much red capacity do they need at any point in time, and how do they um, flip wards from being a, a green or an amber ward over to a red capacity when that's required. And at the moment, given the the surge in COVID admissions, there is a real pressure on making more red capacity available. So that's something we've been collectively working on uh, for a number of weeks now. In order to support servicing those beds and making sure that there's sufficient staff available, the trusts have had to um, make some difficult decisions around what are the, um, the additional services that they can continue to provide? So routine things like outpatients, diagnostics, um, and some of the other services that they offer. The majority of services have continued to be delivered where possible virtually, where not possible face to face, but there may come a point in time if the current surge continues where the hospital does need to start to step down some of the outpatient clinics that they can deliver, some of the diagnostics that they can offer. Uh, we would hope that would be for a very short period of time as they work through the surge and we're perhaps not quite there yet. But as we approach the surge later this week, we might have to make some difficult decisions about standing some things down. And clearly we would love to communicate that out to partners, to our GP practices and to the public um, and do it in a measured way. And we would only want to do that if there were no other alternatives. But I think it's only right that we um, we share that now and we make you aware that if if the pressures become so intense, we might need to do that. Uh, if I can move to the next slide, the next slide really just summarises where we are in using the independent sector. Um, nationally, there's been an agreement to bring independent sector hospitals into the NHS family to provide some additional support. So helping with things like uh, where we've got some priority surgeries that need to happen, can we do those from a, an independent sector hospital um, where we've got um, clean sterile environments, potentially some additional workforce that we can tap into to keep the most urgent surgeries going. Um, so we've been looking to do that with both North Tees and South Tees Trust, working with Ramsey Hospital in Acklam, uh, the Nuffield, Woodlands BMI over at Darlington. Uh, and we've been doing some work with the local cancer cell to prioritise which cancer patients need um, 
a, a, a hospital surgery um, the most urgently and can they be done or delivered from some of these independent sector hospitals. To date, the independent sector have worked really closely with us. There's a great working relationship between them and the NHS trusts, and they've been working really closely to plan how they can use the theatre capacity, the staffing that they've got um, to, to help um, manage as many patients as possible. But I think an important point that we need to reflect on is the fact that in many cases, we're using the same staff groups. So staff who work in James Cook Hospital often work um, evenings, weekends, or additional shifts in the independent sector hospitals as well. So whilst the physical capacity that these hospitals bring is really welcomed, um, it doesn't always come with a great deal of additional workforce. Um, so it's not a magic bullet. They're not a, a fix to the pressures that we've got, but they are an additional tool that we can call upon, and we have been doing that over recent months. If I could uh, move on. So was any can I ask a question there, Craig, please? Could I ask a question, Chair, of Craig, on that? Yes, yes of course. Yes, of course. Uh, Craig, based on what you just said, and, and given the um, quite desperate uh, accounts we get in the news of staffing with their mental health and physical health in jeopardy, um, I just wondered what sort of data we have about the, the well-being of our staff, especially those dealing with the distressing situations we see in the COVID wards. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question actually. So there's there's been a lot of um, a lot of work undertaken to provide additional support to staff in the hospital settings at the moment. So we've been working with Tees Esquire Valley Foundation Trust to make sure that they're able to provide some some mental health, some counselling support into the hospitals. Um, they've been working up a program, a bespoke program around each hospital and each service to make sure that they've got uh, facilities available for staff during breaks, before shift, after shift. Um, it, it's in essence a tailored approach for each each hospital and each group of staff to make sure that they can access support where they need them. And I'm not sure if you'll have seen um, some of the articles in um, some of the local press recently around um, innovations like wobble rooms that were introduced at James Cook. So rooms where staff can can actually go and take a minute, collect the thoughts, uh, seek some support, have a, have a quiet period, just take some time out um, to to help. Um, to help them really make sure that they keep uh, themselves fit and well and that they're in the best, best possible position to support the, the patient groups that they're working with. We also monitor um, routine metrics like staff sickness, etc. Clearly, um, we've seen staff sickness as a result of COVID itself. Uh, we, we always have a residual level of staff sickness running in the background um, and clearly we'll be starting to see and we are starting to see some impact on sickness from the, um, the mental health impact of the pandemic on, on some of our staff groups. We, we did see a peak in staff sickness right at the very beginning of the pandemic in early March and April. That was predominantly down to the fact that we didn't have the testing capabilities that we've got now. So when staff had any kind of sign or symptom, they needed to um, self-isolate. Uh, we're much better with that now, and as Mark will be able to testify, there is, um, there is good routine access to testing available. That's meant we've been able to reduce staff sickness levels significantly, but over recent weeks and, and certainly uh, the last month or so, we have seen um, sickness levels start to increase again to um, up or around uh, the, the 6 and 7% mark in each of the hospital trusts in our patch. Uh, so that's something we're going to continue to monitor really closely and look at what additional support we can offer staff above and beyond what's already in place. Craig, sorry, is, um, do you want to come back? Alma? I just want to say thank you, and I feel reassured because I think we all acknowledge you know, the longer the pandemic continues, the massive pressure that you know just adds and adds and adds to existing pressure, doesn't it? So as much as we can do, it's crucial that we do it. But thank you, Craig, for that answer because I'm reassured that we are doing our very best to take, our, take care of the staff. Thank you. Craig, can I just ask you a question? On the back of Alma's, you know, looking after the staff. Obviously, we have to keep, we have to use the same staff all, over and over again. We can't say, okay, you are tired, go away for a week or go away for a while. We'll bring some rest in. When they're working long hours like this, are we doing things like providing free meals for them, for example? Because if we're not, I think we ought to be. That, I know a, it's probably not in your, it's not under your umbrella, yeah, but. That's a great question. I know that um, earlier on in the pandemic, there was some support provided to staff on the James Cook site where they were. They're being provided with um with with their lunch i'm not 100 percent sure if that's continued and again it's something i could go away and talk to the the three local hospital trusts about um just to understand 
any any kind of um, support that is being offered the staff along those lines. But I couldn't really comment at this point in time because I don't I don't know enough about it. So no. I would mean. like that. I would like that to be you know uh to be sort of explored uh, by whoever if possible please i think yeah, that's the least you can, can do for them i can certainly pick out thank you thank you okay great so i think we're on, we're on the final straight now just um a couple of couple of slides with um priorities for the remainder of this year then so we will flick on to the next one that's great so really i mean as you'd expect really continue to respond to the covid 19 um, demand so as pressures on beds go up as pressures um, to access services whether they're in or out of hospital increase we're just looking at how we can respond differently uh, innovative solutions different ways of accessing services whether that's digital face-to-face -face, or any other for format um, progressing the, the vaccination program clearly uh, the vaccination program started well but we uh, we really need to push on with that and there's some some targets around making sure that every adult's been offered the vaccination by september clearly if if it's at all possible we'd like to go um, further than that and the sooner we can offer the vaccine to everybody the better um, so we'll be working with our primary care networks our mass testing site up to our mass vaccination sites and local pharmacies to to increase the offer that's available uh, again, maximising the capacity in all settings to treat non-COVID patients, and that's a real challenge for us at the moment. So we talked earlier on around cancelling electives. Um, we've talked about the possibility that outpatients might need to be scaled back. We really need to get back on top of those those um, treatments, those clinics that need to be in place and operational to support patients who don't have don't have COVID but do have other other clinical needs. So that'll be a key focus for certainly the CCG as we move forward um, in the in the um, end of, of this financial year. Uh, responding to other emergency demand and managing winter pressures, you know, again, we're, we're continuing to expect bad weather over the coming days and the cold weather snaps keep hitting. And just as a health service, we need to respond to that as well, just because we've got COVID doesn't mean that we um, we can't focus on those other kind of issues as well. So every time we see a cold snap, every time we see the snow, we do see um, some spikes, maybe not to the degree we've seen in previous years, but we see spikes in demand for access to GP practices, and pressure on A&E departments, pressure on the urgent treatment centres, etc. that we need to continue to manage and support our staff with. Uh, and then finally, you know, just supporting the health and wellbeing of our workforce and not just health, but care, care staff as well. So staff within the local authorities, within our care homes, because at the end of the day, the, the bulk of the NHS is the staff and without those, the NHS as a whole would, would fail to operate yeah. uh, and at this point in time, keeping, keeping our staff well motivated and focused on the job in hand is a key priority for us so whatever we can do to work with other providers such as the mental health trust um, to provide that support we will. and i think that's that's pretty much it from myself i'm more than happy to take any further questions uh, chair if there was anything thank, that anybody wanted to thank ask. you craig no problem. you can just call out if you have any questions please can i ask a question chair yes thank um, you that's the story I, yeah I, I just wanted to ask i'd noted something um Craig, about uh, blood plasma, because I know that we, the NHS have been um, harvesting blood plasma as a therapeutic treatment. And um, I'd, I'd, I'd seen an article that in Ashford in Kent, they, they'd closed down their centre that was collecting blood plasma because there was a study by Oxford University that suggested that blood plasma actually might not be that effective in actually helping treat COVID. I just wondered, did we... Did we invest a lot of our time or funding or capacity in blood plasma here and do we have any concerns around around blood plasma as a potential therapeutic treatment yeah, and again you know i'm, I'm not I'm not clinical um unfortunately my clinical colleague was unable to, to make it today because of clinical commitments uh, but what i can say is that i've, I've seen a similar article to the one that you're referring to i know that there have been some news reports around um, questioning the, the effectiveness of blood plasma as a treatment so what I can do is look at um, getting a more formal response on that for you. As far as I'm aware, we, we haven't spent a significant amount of time or energy in, um, in harvesting blood plasma. So I don't think it's it's something that settles back. But I don't know whether, Mark, have you got any anything that you may want to add? Is there anything on the public health networks again that, that would add? No, nothing. I haven't got any specific information on that at all. No, apologies. So we'll, we'll look to, to, to get some more information to your council story where, where we can. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. 
Councillor Morstan, you wanted to come in. Did you have your hand up there, um, Councillor Coop? Uh, yes, I do. I'll, I'll wait for Councillor Morstan. Thank you. Yes, yes. Councillor Morstan, you want a question? Hello. Got a bit of information. Um, a question about food and drink for staff in hospitals. Um, they were getting when it being donated at the beginning of the um, pandemic, but I believe since the donations dried up, um, it's not readily available for them. Equally, I understand that uh, sometimes there's no chance to eat time to eat or drink. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, um, Tom. Councillor Morrison, I think that's something we should possibly look at or ask somebody else to look at on our behalf because, you know, we, you know, some of them might go home and they're just too tired to, to cook a meal for themselves. And obviously, the next, you know, their blood sugar levels will go down or whatever. Um, it's vital that we keep, keep these people well fed. So I'd like somebody somewhere to look into that for us, please. Um, any office? Church. Nobody? <laughs> It's certainly something that I can pick up with Thank you. The foundation trust and understand what the current position is. And if I Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Appreciate that. that. that okay? Thank you. Sure. Councillor Coop. Yes, thanks, Sharon. I would agree with that. If for someone who doesn't eat too much during the day when I should or doesn't drink, um, it, it is very important because we don't want staff being ill, having headaches and things because they haven't mm -hmm. been able to eat or drink during the day. So I agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, next thing is the $64,000 question. Once we get over this peak now, which hopefully we will over the next month or so, and hopefully we'll get it under control, do you see that it levelling off as it did last year, level off sort of before May, June time? And do you see it having still a problem in September, October when we start to get into the bad weather? I know it's a $60,000 question, but people must understand how the health service is going to go back there so we can start get back to normal we can start to get back to do what the health service does best to serve the patients with other things cancers things like that and all the way down the line so i just wondered how your plans are looking for that and do you see any more peaks coming out of this before we get better i think from a, from a health service perspective um we're, we're putting a lot of stock in the the vaccine and the vaccine supporting in terms of reducing the number of of, of significant or severe cases requiring hospitalisation, um, and that in itself would would then create the capacity to provide more support for non-COVID patients. But I think we we also need to be realistic that it's highly likely that COVID is going to be with us for for quite some time, um, possibly a number of years, um, and we're going to have to find new ways of dealing with that, um, and making sure that we continue to provide routine treatments, surgeries, outpatient clinics, etc alongside responding to um, COVID demand. But in terms of any, any longer term modeling, Mark might be better placed to, to chip in on that in terms of anything that's been done um, via a public health perspective. I, I haven't seen any specific modeling, but I think that the, the, the natural course of the virus would be, as you say, that in, in sort of late spring, early summer, it'll, it'll fade naturally. And I, th I think that, um, Around about that sort of time, the, the, well, by uh, Easter, the bulk of the over 70s, I'm not quite sure what the actual date of the or the target of all over 70s vaccinated, which which should significantly reduce the mortality uh, from COVID. And I think as you work through those priority groups, the, the harm that COVID causes will lessen as more people are vaccinated. And then it's a question of understanding how long the vaccine lasts for and how, how frequently the booster is required. And then pick, uh, keeping up with um, the new vari variants that we keep seeing, be it the South African one or the one that was found originally in, in this country. Uh, and then from uh, sort of August, September time, it'll be understanding what changes need to be made to, to, to maintain the benefits from the vaccination program and how frequently that needs to be um, that those boosters need to, need to happen because obviously primary care delivering it at the moment has an impact on what primary care is able to deliver that it would normally be doing. Um, uh, and the, the, as you've talked about before, the, the kind of fatigue of, of the staff, it all tends to end up in the same key staff groups that are delivering um, these issues. So I think across the whole swathes of society, we have to figure out what does it look like post-summer. But I think the harm from COVID will diminish from sort of Easter time, late spring, once the vaccine started to, um, um, or the, the vaccination program has worked its way through significant proportions of the population. Um, so I, I don't anticipate that the same harm next autumn, but quite how we how we live with it and what we need to do to kind of minimize that further. 
will probably be more of the same, but less likely to be involved um, the sort of lockdowns that we've seen, I would imagine, but I haven't seen specific modeling around that. I have seen some um, suggestions that it'd be like a booster jab you might get in, say, the autumn, like we did get the flu jab at the moment. So you might get some booster jab, which will be targeted at the variants they believe, which is exactly the same as flu. So we could live with this a few years. The only slightly worrying thing there are in this latest batch I've seen on television, some more younger people there, say, in the 30s and 40s, are suffering for a low to nowhere near the extent that the people in the 70 plus are. So I suppose the modelling will go there. You'll look at uh, whatever you need, a boost or whatever you're going to get, and that could carry on for as many years as we need to do it. It'll either be included in the flu jab or the separate jab you would get. Are you happy with that, Councillor Coop? I am, yes. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Any more, any more questions from anyone? No. Thank you very much for that, Craig. Um, both yourself and Mark are very welcome to stay on, um, but obviously uh, we can't tie you, tie you to the place. You, you can go home if you want to. Well, actually, go home if you want to. Um, you can leave the meeting if you want to. Uh, thank you very much. I'm no doubt we'll see you again pretty soon. Um, if I could go on then to agenda number five, health and wealth and introduction, and, and we have Lisa Jones somewhere here. We have Lisa. Lisa, would you like to um, start the ball rolling, please? Yeah, no problem. Um, hi, I'm Lisa Jones. For those of you who don't know me, I work for Public Health South Tees. I'm part of the Middlesbrough Council Public Health Team. Um, and I'm going to present on a new topic, which is health and wealth, and hopefully set the scene in terms of how those kind of two key areas of um, sexual responsibility, public health and economic development, um, need to be more unified really in terms of improving population health and reducing inequalities. Caroline, are you happy to bring up the presentation i'll just give you a moment if you jump right onto the second slide in the pack thank you it's vanished doesn't want to present no uh, it started with a quote basically from the health foundations which was basically demonstrating that the relationship between health and wealth is so intrinsic and intertwined that you can't really um, consider these two things separately um, and we know that um, in terms of how economic um, determinants of health um, have a strong influence and opportunities to lead healthier lives so things like income, employment status, education will have a will have a natural impact on health outcomes and quality. Here we are. So yeah if we jump right onto two Caroline that'd be great thank you. Yeah. So yes, so economic determinants of health play a strong influence in terms of our um, health outcomes, but equally um, the health of an area will also determine things like the resilience, the diversity and the productivity, for example, of the labour market, which will obviously affect um, our prospects for economic development as well. Um, and I think what that demonstrates, if you get a unification of those two agendas absolutely right, economic development becomes one of the most powerful tools that we have at our disposal to improve population health and reduce policies in our area. Can you move on to the next slide? Thank you. So one thing we know globally around economic development, I've put economic growth there, but it's a bit of a, a dirty word, economic growth now, but economic development affects places very, very differently. Um, and even more than the majority of all other de um, developed countries um, has high levels of variation in terms of how economic policy and strategy um, impacts on levels of productivity, um, income, um, and, and obviously to health impact as well. And, and this kind of suggests that our economic development plans and policies and our approach to economic strategy um, isn't particularly context sensitive. And it also demonstrates the, the role and importance of place shaping in terms of how, of how economic uh, development and public health policy needs to unify. Um, place is a critical factor, and I'll move on to that in the, um, in the presentation. Um, as, it, as it's really the third bullet point, as you can't see at the minute, <laughs> but it, what it says is really that, the, um, that health isn't just a product of, um, of a thriving economy. It's actually not. Um, sorry, Chair. Sorry, Chair. Can I just get your presentation up in the presentation format? Because I haven't got it on the screen at the moment, Lisa. Sorry. I'll just be one second, Chair. I'll just. You know, I'll, I'll be one second turning the heating up because I'm frozen. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so sorry. Right, it's fine.
Can everyone say that? Yeah, can you say that? Do you, oh, do you sorry. So yes, yeah, so this is mentioning um, health is such a product of a thriving economy. It's actually a necessary contributor to that. And in the previous slide, obviously, I mentioned around things like the diversity of the labour market, the resilience of the labour market, the false, false shift of the economy. Um, so it very much is a, is a massive contributor in terms of the success of our economic development strategy. Can you move on to the next slide, Caroline, please? Thank you. Um, this is a typical um, way of demonstrating the link between socioeconomic status and, and health. So we look at a social gradient of health in terms of life expectancy. At the top, obviously, you've got your most deprived population going down through to your more affluent population at the bottom. And from left to right, you've got blue, your health and life expectancy and your actual life. Sorry, sorry, can I just interrupt you a moment, Lisa? Is anybody having difficulty hearing what's being said? I've got some feedback on my, so I don't think people are able to mute. Um, is everybody, is that better? Oh, I can hear a little bit back again. Um, There's some background noise. Is everybody muted? Um, the, um, yes, yeah, so they demonstrating basically that um, where you live and your and your levels of deprivation will have a significant impact in terms of how long you can expect to live and how long you can expect to live in good health. And that's not just a trend that's seen nationally. We see this in, in the local level as well. So we have wards in Middlesbrough, which are less than two miles apart with over 10 years difference in life expectancy, um, which is which is really worrying. And, um, and to add to that, the Marmot review that came out, I think at the end of 2019, which was a reflection on his previous um, report in 2010, um, demonstrated that actually any increases in life expectancy that we'd seen over previous years was now either stagnating or more worryingly starting to decline. Um, and, and that is a real a worrying trend. But the narrative in terms of, of, of why that was the case was largely pointing at austerity and the disproportionate um, impact that austerity measures had up and down the country, but also um, and, and the social protections that um, austerity potentially um, reduced on, on particular population groups, but also um, the impact of the 2008 economic recession and how that impacted on um, population health as well. Um, and either way you cut it, an overriding narrative of that was, was that link between health and wealth again and why it's so critically important to see the two um, in tandem. So if you're happy to move on to the next slide, Caroline. Um, as I mentioned before, health isn't just a, a product of a thriving economy, it's a contributor to it. And we even seen before COVID the impact of poor health on um, the national economy, but this is actually more of a significant impact on our local economy. But at the, um, at the national level, roughly about £100 billion a year is lost in productivity as a result of poor health. We also see things like mental health costing around £42 billion, and that's probably an underestimate um, in terms of workforce costs. And we also know at the same time is, is, is knowing that fact that we the mental the employment and job stability has a protective impact on mental health. So again, it's demonstrating that the two are very much intertwined. Um, and what it just demonstrates as well is that the pace and the commitment towards prevention and health improvement and health inequalities um, will either stifle or it will bring on your economic development strategies. So you can't really afford to design those two separately. They're very much intertwined. Um, and on to the next slide. COVID has really kind of just brought further into light something that was hiding in plain sight, which was, again, the, so the social gradient of health. Um, and what we've seen as early as May was that those living in their more socioeconomically deprived areas was twice as likely to die as those in the more affluent areas. Um, and now what we're starting to see trends in um, the risk of men, in particular with low skill jobs, almost, almost having um, a four time risk of COVID death in professionals. Um, and that's a massive social injustice to think that your patient um, plays a role in, in terms of your um, prospects of, of survival in this pandemic, but also in future pandemics as well. And that's something that very much, um, again, kind of reiterates the point that socioeconomic status and health and wealth is very much part of the same, part of much the same agenda. 
Um, and they're just some of the direct impacts of COVID. Um, we have had some more indirect impacts, again, that reinforce that link between um, health and wealth in terms of the impact on the economy and how that translated into particular socioeconomic groups. So those um, who um, were more at risk of permanent layoffs were over half of those were from jobs that pay less than £10 an hour. Um, and at the same time as that was happening, the more affluent professional roles, um, they evolved quite quickly into home-based working. They were able to function in home-based working capacity where they had children. They were able to make sure that they accessed ongoing education much more easily. And also they weren't really spending as much. So they were um, not going on holidays or um, you know, engaging in local hospitality sector, which actually meant they were accumulating more savings. So if anything, this is kind of polarised inequalities that already existed pre-COVID, which um, again reinforces the need that levelling up and more inclusive economic growth strategies are going to be a critical component to our COVID recovery, um, not just in Middlesbrough, but, but also nationally. And we can keep investing in kind of fiscal stimulus and measures that help and protect people and services that support recovery from COVID and help people move into paid employment, etc. But actually critical to sustainability in that front is around um, creating the conditions for inclusive growth. So if you're happy to move on to the next slide, I'm going to show you a really <laughs> convoluted framework for um, understanding. I won't go into any great detail because I accept this text is very small. Um, but what this is basically demonstrating is the interrelationship between health and wealth isn't straightforward. It's it's not linear causality, as we'd call it in public health. It does work through and between various different factors to shape health and health outcomes. And what we tend to see is that macroeconomic policies and economic development strategies work through more intermediate factors, such as living conditions and working conditions to ultimately impact on health but that that impact is, is reciprocal. Um, it is a very complex relationship, but I think this just gives a good example of why you need that unification of your, um, employ uh, your um, economic development policies and public health. So, for instance, you could have a local regeneration strategy that wanted to create a more buoyant housing market in Middlesbrough, which is great and absolutely something that we'd like to see in Middlesbrough. The impact of that might, for instance, be that you'll see house prices driven up um, to a degree where those on sort of low income wages um, or unemployed are priced out of local housing markets um, and or they take on houses where they accumulate more debt, they have less disposable income, they're not therefore afforded the same kind of choices in terms of nutrition and access to um, leisure activities and everything else which then will ultimately impact on their health. So by taking a decision in isolation from a region and economic development point of view, there could be a disproportionate impact on health that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, and there's very much a case for health inequality impact assessing everything that we do from an inequality, from a health development angle to make sure that that doesn't happen. And that actually we don't just minimize the potential negative impacts, that, but we maximize the, the positive impacts that economic development can have, again, in terms of improving health and reducing inequalities. Um, I've mentioned COVID, um, but I guess the other, the other factor to into the mix that is of particular concern if we don't get this right is Brexit and um, we have benefited um, previously from EU structural funding which basically is in place to ensure that we have got inclusive growth strategies that will be replaced by shared prosperity fund which is a UK fund and it won't be devolved to nation states if you like nation uh, our devolved nations it will um, we're not sure how that's actually going to play out and if we don't start working more particularly in tandem with the Northern Powerhouse, with our colleagues in the Tees Valley Combined Authority about how that investment is used to shape areas like Middlesbrough and to make sure that that's context sensitive and takes into consideration some of the health challenges and some of the wider issues around um, deprivation and socioeconomic circumstances. There is the potential that we will even as a result of Brexit start to see polarisation of inequalities. Are you happy to move on to the next slide please Caroline? Okay, so brilliant. So as I mentioned earlier, place is absolutely critical. So any unification of your economic development and your public health policies need to be very much rooted in place. Um, and this is just a population intervention triangle, which is the evidence-based tool that particularly NHS, but also public health are uh, using more frequently to make sure that they're the interventions and the um, the investment decisions and the way that we design and work with communities and develop services um, and try to influence policies and, and use local authority powers 
need to work in unison to make sure that it has a place impact and not just a very small impact on a very small area for a very small population group. So on the next slide, I will try and use that framework to demonstrate some of the things and the roles that local councils can do to better align their economic development and health policies. And this just gives you a flavour for some of the things that have been done nationally and in other areas that have had um, some impact in terms of how it's improved health um, just through economic development. So one of the key things at the civic level, so this is about the policies, how we use local powers, for instance, at a local authority, at a CCG, a combined authority level to, to shape and determine economic development and public health policy. Um, one of the key things within that is that we have a strong long-term vision and leadership um, that underpins um, a desire to design economies that are good for people's health. And that generally means policies and strategies that promote social cohesion, equity, participation, um, that encourage and increase access to um, health services and products that are health promoting and restricting access to products and things that are less health promoting um, and are detrimental to health. Um, and also um, strategies and plans which very much embed in environmental sustainability because we know that that has also a, a really positive health impact in terms of um, increasing physical activity, for instance, reducing carbon emissions, which obviously impacts on air quality and respiratory health. Um, one of the other ways that we can harness the civic level interventions to, to better unify health and um, economic development is through more di um, sort of diagnostic approach in terms of how economic development policies play out at a local area. So there's some really great examples in Scotland where they've created diagnostic tools, which basically health impact assess all the economic development policies so that, again, they maximise the positives and minimise the negative impact of, um, of, of economic policy and development. And they've achieved some improvements in health and reducing the health inequalities just as a result of that very simple, straightforward approach. Um, Capitalising on local assets and using local powers more actively. So we have access to things like Section 106 funding, um, which is obviously development costs, which you, which are in place to, uh, as part of planning applications to make sure that we mitigate risks um, from housing developments in local areas and the impact that has on communities. But there's, there's various different ways that that could be used to make sure that we um, build better healthcare infrastructure or that we invest in local skills and opportunities to make sure that any housing developments that, that we um, authorise as a local authority have a... Um, a positive impact on a community and don't further polarise communities or create social disconnectedness. Um, at a community level, we can um, build strong citizens' engagement, how we involve local communities in planning decisions. And I mean that not just tokenistically, but actually enabling communities to co-design and um, co-produce plans and strategies around economic development and health and to make sure that any kind of economic development aspirations, make their aspirations as a local community so that they're not left behind. Um, and then at a service level, and I think there's some really good examples of where we're starting to take that more seriously in local authority about uniting um, the services that we provide in terms of what we offer um, from a socioeconomic perspective, but of, or welfare perspective, and also from a health perspective. So we have um, a vulnerability policy now, which is very much looking at our approach to debt recovery and how we take on board wider circumstances to, um, to shape how we, how we deal with debt. But we possibly need to take that slightly further. We've got health visiting services, for instance, which have universal access to every single family in Middlesbrough. How well do they address issues such as poverty, um, employment and all those type of things, because they're uniquely placed to do that. So there's a lot that we're doing, there's a lot that can be done, but hopefully that just sets the scene as to why this is quite a critical agenda item. And personally, I think it's one of the most powerful things, like I said, that we can do to improve population health and reduce health inequalities. And happy to take any questions that you might have. I have a question, Jim. Oh. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, yes, Councillor Cope, off you go. Thank you. Um, very interesting subject. Uh, I think if you go back many years to this area when we were mainly iron, steel, chemicals, etc., the average man, and I'd say that uh, advisedly, the average man working in the industry, because it mainly was men in those days, um, they would retire at 65 and they'd be dead before they were 70. Um, we've hopefully moved on from those terrible days, but with this, 
it implies that the levels could start to fall again. It could start to get um, people dying at a younger age. You do comparisons there between area and the more affluent southern areas, dare I say. Um, if you look at all the studies have done, and we've all read them, I certainly have read them, uh, over the years, it depends on uh, everybody's economic um, differences that we've got, where industries you work in, obviously, we have to strive to get the life and sex expectancy up. Certainly in this area, we, we don't have a particularly good life expectancy, we never have. But we need to work on this. And I, I think what you presented there is an excellent way of understanding that. Mm -hmm. But how do you think that this area will go? And you, you said about the COVID side of it, the, you know, you've got more chances as a COVID person if you're working in, in industry rather than if you're if you're blue collar worker as opposed to white collar worker. Do you look at that as not only their working conditions, but perhaps their home conditions? Or do you spread that across the board? It, there's other reasons for that. Thank you. So, like I mentioned in the presentation, your kind of employment status, your job security, the income that you attract from your job affects your life choices, it affects where you live, your community, the, some options that you have in terms of how you lead your life and all those type of things. And naturally, if we've seen um, a degeneration of that, particularly in our more poorer areas, we will expect to see, and I imagine we are already starting to see, particularly in mental health services, a decline in health status. Um, I think... One of the things that worries me, and I mentioned at our public health DMT today, is the um, Institute of Financial Studies have, um, Institute of IFS, forgot the name, how, what it actually stands for, um, but they're basically looking at um, how COVID has impacted on the economy and what that, that says about areas that have been left behind. So pre-COVID, we were identified as an area that has been left behind in terms of particularly the north-south divide. But now they're overlaying that with areas that have been hardest hit by COVID economically. And worryingly for all, economically, we haven't been hit that hard because we aren't an area that's overly reliant on tourism, for instance, and we aren't an area with a massive retail present and we were already in decline in terms of our retail offer. So there is a risk that things like the shared prosperity fund will be um, kind of um, shipped out to areas that you traditionally see like Liverpool and Manchester at the expense of areas like Middlesbrough, whose economic status is just so far intrinsically related to our health that we become further and, and, and farther divided from um, some of our more affluent regions. So it, it, it is worrying. I don't know, Mark, if you've got anything to add to that. I, I just think it's fundamental to everything, isn't it? Was it Marmot that said the, the best public health intervention is to give everybody a good job? I think that's and that's that's how this is all linked. And I think that the, the purpose of bringing this to, to, to scrutiny is to help shape a, 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 an agenda over the next few meetings around um, key lines of inquiry and how 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 we might interrogate this subject a little bit further to understand how we can do more by, as Lisa mentioned, changes to policies and consideration of of the wealth element of it uh, in common with health at the same time, rather than as two separate issues. Can we can we do things differently? So there's areas like social value, which Lisa didn't, didn't touch on, which we're doing some stuff on, but we could potentially look to work with all anchor institutions within Middlesbrough to in, in, um, increase the amount of resource and, uh, that stays within Middlesbrough or the Tees Valley, which obviously has an impact on jobs. And there's a whole raft of things that um, take work and effort but don't necessarily take additional resources it's about how we use the existing resources we've got and how we're more considerate of the impact of decisions taken in one arena on another arena and how can we how can we make those that impact positive rather than negative um, I, I think the potential of this area is huge and to an extent one of the biggest tools that we've got in in Middlesbrough to actually affect change um other than attracting you know the brexit funds and all that sort of stuff but they're they're unknown at the moment so some of this is within our within our gift and that of partners um so ju just a really important area i think i don't know if that added to what you said and it's the institute of fiscal studies i think you were you were <laughs> reading for <laughs> chair can i just just add one point to that um now we've we've sadly uh left the eu in the sense of we don't get any grants anymore there's new brexit grants are going to come in it's a targeting of that to make sure it goes to the areas where, you know, it's no good just saying, right, we'll give some money to Middlesbrough and it benefits all the suburbs like where I live and where lots of us may live. 
it's got to target the areas within the centre of the town, with the other parts of the town, so they benefit. The economic benefit of all this has got to go to the right people. And yes, we can all benefit from it, but it is most important that it's before it goes to the communities that will see the, the benefit so that they don't slip any further down. Mark, can I also add that um, you said, you know, that the, the secret is to give everybody a good job. In order to do that, we have to have people with a very good education or very good qualifications to suit that good job. And that isn't that isn't easy to do. Yeah. And part of that is things like the South East Development Corporation and, and, and the jobs that are going to come online. How what what can Middlesbrough Council and Rickard and Cleveland and other councils be doing to ensure that our people can benefit from those jobs when they come on stream rather than a whole other people coming in from other areas? Yes. Ha having, you know, potentially come from more affluent backgrounds and, and, and had a different education, should we, should we say? So it's, it's just ensuring that all those opportunities actually benefit as much as possible without getting kind of too almost nationalistic, but on a very regional level about how, how can we ensure that all of those developments benefit the people of Middlesbrough as much as possible and not disproportionately such that health inequalities are broadened through it. Councillor Story, you wanted to come in? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I mean, this is um, this is really ple pleasing to see. I, I, I actually, at the council meeting before um, Christmas, I actually raised an, the IPPR's report into um, public health um, and inequality, which... Um, a lot of the information contained in this presentation um, is 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 exactly the same as the, the research that they did. Um, and I'm really pleased that it's been taken forward. And it's something I raised with the Mayor and the Chief Executive to say um, we should be progressing with. So I'm dead chuffed to see um, that this has happened. I mean, the fact is that we live in um, one of the most unequal countries in the world and certainly the most unequal country in Western Europe. Um, they... Uh, Cuts to public health in the northeast are three times higher than cuts to public health in the southeast of England. Um, so we don't just live in an unequal country; we live in one of the most regionally unequal countries as well. So between from region to region, it, the the uh, inequalities are exacerbated from region to region. And um, you mentioned the Brexit situation, which is an interesting one because one of the things that the EU did was it didn't just um, redistribute funds to the poorest countries within the EU, it redistributed funds to the poorest regions of the poorest countries in the EU, which meant that an area like the North East benefited disproportionately from EU funding, structural funds um, and economic development funds because it was the, one of the poorest areas of, of the country, but also one of the poorest areas within the entire EU. Um, and we will no longer have that. So the, this, this shared prosperity fund, it'll be very interesting to see how that comes forward. If you look at TVCA's audit plans, and, and I chair the audit panel at TVCA, the um, European um, stuff, the Brexit situation and the new shared prosperity fund is actually one of their amber or red risks in their risk register. And it's a big red and amber risk because they don't know how much money is coming and they don't know how it will be distributed. And, that, and that's a real problem for us because we need to be able to plan for these things. And, and to bring it back to public health, um, when when you look at the report here, I think the two key things I would like to see us be doing is, number one, we should be um, health impact assessing everything we do. Absolutely everything should be assessed in a public health sense um, and inclusive of in economic development, but inclusive of all the stuff we do as a council. Um, we should be looking at places like... Um, uh, New Zealand, where the government actually have metrics that they judge the success or failure of their regional and national government on public health outcomes. Um, they, they, we, we tend to judge economic growth as you know, GDP, increasing your GDP by 4%. That's the gold standard. That's what you've got to do. But in terms of climate change and in terms of public health, economic growth is no longer the metric that we should be looking at. And I think public health and uh, people's well-being and happiness, which sounds like an odd thing to say, but how happy we are um, and how comfortable we are in our society is a much better way of judging how successful a local authority or a government is than how much money we make. Um, and that is all hand, goes hand in hand with the equality and trying to level the playing field for people. Um, one of the things, I'll fi finish with this, but the final thing that I want to say is, and, and it's been touched on by Council McTagg as well, the interconnected nature of what we do as a council, it cannot be stressed enough. Uh, austerity and cuts to any area of the public sector impacts on all areas of the public sector. 
And if you cut something in health or you cut something in crime or you cut something in education, wherever the cut falls, it will have an interconnected impact on something else. And what public health does in a way that some areas of public policy don't, public health cuts across every single area. And that that complicated flow chart that we saw there, which was really helpful, I think, it had transport, it had policing, it had infrastructure, it had everything in there that you would you would expect to see in a flow chart of the public sector. And it all relates to public health. So I think this is a really good starting point. And how we follow this through as a council and how we follow it through in terms of funding and how we manage our budgetary pressures alongside all of this, I think it's going to be really interesting. But it's certainly, I think, the right way forward. Thank you, Councillor Story. What makes one person happy, Councillor Story, doesn't make another person happy. Some people are perfectly co content with very little in their lives, and some people want an awful lot out of life. So we can't really say that um, we should judge on people's happiness. It, it isn't, it isn't um, a one, one size fits all, if you see what I mean. But thank you for that. It was very interesting. Um, I don't think there's anybody else. Oh, Councillor Rooney, you wanted to speak? And Alma, you next. Councillor Rooney, if you go. Thanks, Chair. Um, just really going on from what Matt said, because I think he's covered a lot of what I would have raised anyway. But my concern is about the, the length of the funding. When we're talking about the Shared Prosperity Fund, it is it is a worry. Um, and is it going to turn into a bun fight? Are we going to have to fight for our share mm -hmm. of it? And how long is it going to last? Is a concern because somebody who um, in the 90s led a community care program, and then Elise has just touched on this with health visitors. We uh, instigated a three year training program with health visitors on identifying housing issues. So around poor housing conditions, homelessness, debt, all of those related. And that, that was really successful in identifying people who, who needed some more support, wasn't necessarily provided by the health visitors, but was referred appropriately. Um, and that was a successful project, but again, it was only three years and then it died. And, it, and it's this longevity that we've got to try and build in to all of this to make sure that what we start, we can not only just you know we can continue to do it because this isn't something that's going to be fixed in in five or ten years it's it's, it's a much longer term program all right thank you councillor Rooney, can i just answer you there by saying i think we have to accept now that we have to fight for everything we have to fight for absolutely everything Chair, I believe your um, microphone is muted, but I promise that I haven't done anything, so I don't know if there's a problem with the microphone. Chair, can you hear me? No, I can't. Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear yeah. you now, Chair. There seems to be something wrong with your microphone in, um, this afternoon, so I do apologise. So no, I can't see anyone. There. Oh, no, I can't. no, I can't see anyone. Are you able to hear us, though, I Chair? I can see you now. Sorry. Okay, I keep, that's lovely. I keep losing the camera. I keep losing the video as well. Sorry. Okay. What I wanted to say was, Councillor Rooney, we have to accept that we have to fight for everything. Absolutely, we have to fight for every single penny these days. Unfortunately, nothing comes our way just by saying, I want it, unfortunately. Um, now then, I think, Councillor Halawi, you wanted to say something. Yes, thank you, Joe. Um, I'm absolutely in favour of doing everything we can to um, look at the interconnectedness of health with all of the other aspects of policy development and practical implementation of the um, policies that we look at. Um, but it's obvious that, that we're highly dependent on a national decision-making process that to some extent is out of our hands. So I think we are sort of in a difficult position to start with. And my question was going to be, given that, that we are hampered by national issues, and as Joan said, we have to fight for everything all the time in that respect. Looking at the Scottish model that you mentioned, um, Lisa, I expect that that model which you said was deemed to be successful and had made progress in different areas, that's been a whole of the Scotland model, was it? It wasn't a regional model. 
So my question is, is it possible in some respects regionally to take examples of good practice from that model, which was probably national, and transpose the model into a regional uh, working strategy? Yeah, and I think there were some examples of that in terms of the town fund process and they looked at kind of a similar diagnostic tool in terms of areas really identifying what their biggest challenges were to, to development and regeneration and building those into the, the But absolutely, things like that could be lifted and shifted from other areas and adopted. It just takes that change of mindset. Um, a co like you say, it has to be absolutely across the board in terms of people investing in those processes. Um, and we, we are reacting quite quickly to funding and we're reacting quite quickly to decisions. It's obviously COVID it changes things massively in terms of our, our reactive But we do have to take the time to take those kind of tools on board because they do pay dividends if you get them right, absolutely. Thank you. Chair, can uh, I make one comment, please? Yes, yes, Councillor Cooper, off you go. Yeah, I, I agree with um, what Councillor Zoe said about the fact that this fund is going to replace some of the, the excellent funds that the Europe gave us. And of course, we're quite right. We have, we've been in a, an area of deprivation for, for many, many years, and this fund needs to be tailored that way. It does seem that in the in problems with a lot of government funds for whatever government uh, and i'm not trying to put a slant on it uh, they don't last very long or they may have a limited life like three years or something like that so it's something that's going to affect this area for many years we need to as a council and as a local authority and as a tees valley local authority to make sure that we put a plan in place which gives us prosperity over the next years not only in housing but also in health and other equalities that we need to have for this area. We need to fight for it uh, every step of the way. We need to say we're the North East, we're Middlesbrough, and we want something uh, to benefit from us. We want more jobs that are higher paid. Uh, I understand what Councillor Matai said about uh, education, but Ryan, we've got a fantastic university. We've got great colleges and things. We want to make sure we do get the education here. And whatever we have to do, whenever we have to push it, we have to get that. So yes, I agree, and yes, we all have to fight. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Coop, can I add that we have to get the children to university first of all before we can, you know? I do agree with that. Um, as a past student of Teesside Uni, I understand that. Um, but we need to get them there and we need mm. to persuade them. We've got a fantastic university. And if they wanted to go, there are some others in the North East. I think there's apparently one at Newcastle and I think there's one at Durham. So, you know, education is where we're at and that should encourage as many people to take it up as possible. Thank you. And it's not just a question of wanting to go. It's a question of uh, getting sufficient qualifications to get there in the first place. You know, unfortunately, in some of our areas, children don't have ambitions. Um, and I suppose they get that from the background. The parents have had their ambitions and they don't expect the children to have ambitions. And that's very sad because I think we're losing out on an awful lot of talent that way. But, you know, how, how we correct that is another matter. But can I just make one? Can I just make one? It's also a necessity. Some some children can't work, they can't go to university because they, they need to go out and earn money. Yes. And that is the big thing. Until we can get away from that, that is a problem. The children may want to go to university, they may be desperate to go to university, yeah. but if their family hasn't got the money to be able to pay for it and they and yeah. the rents and things, then they should do that. So we, we we're Absolutely. stepping out of an area, but it's something we need to look at. Thank you, Jim. Absolutely. Can I just can I can I just can I just make what fun before we finish? To a certain extent, our health is in our own hands, and we haven't really touched on that. Um, in this area, we are famous for the amount of people who are become ill or die because of the amount of alcohol they take or the amount of cigarettes they smoke. So I think, it, I know we do spend an awful lot of time and money and hours on trying to educate people not to do that, but maybe we're not doing that enough because um, you know the figures show that um, too many people are dying because of, they're not looking after their own health themselves. You wanted to speak, Caroline, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Chair. I was just going to come in to say, obviously, we've just had kind of an introduction presentation today in terms of this topic and what the mm -hmm. panel might like to actually um, focus on as part of over the next few um, months on this topic, yeah. because I think um, hopefully we'll be able to have the opportunity to sort of do a bit more research and, and, and speak to um, some other... Yes. 
some other bodies as well that um, potentially we might be able to learn from if there are examples elsewhere in the country or there's places that are maximising social value or using the anchor institutions, um, as you made reference to. Um, and those are sort of possibly the areas that that we that, that the panel could focus on. So I was just going to suggest, Chair, if we drop some draft terms of reference for this this review and present those at the next meeting of the panel, whether that will be okay, and then the members members can decide whether they're happy with that or whether they want to make any amendments, um, and who the panel would like to invite to provide evidence in respect of this review as well over the course of say the next three meetings possibly. And that's Caroline's way. That's Caroline's way of politely telling us we're going off topic. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind in the least. Thank you, Caroline, for keeping us straight. Right. I think we've 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 um, finished on on that. I think nobody else wants to ask anything. Um, so thank you very much for Lisa. You're still there, aren't you? Yeah. Thank you very much for your um, your time and your presentation. It was very good and very informative. And I hope to see you again soon. I'm sure we will. Uh, 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 uh. Right, I think Caroline, you wanted to take um, agenda item six. Yes, Chair. Um, obviously, um, this is the panel's draft final report on opioid dependency. Um, and as members are aware, we've we've been doing this piece of work for quite a while now. Um, and ordinarily, um, I would take the panel through the draft final report, highlighting some comments we received, and then after that, would ask the panel to discuss what sort of conclusions and recommendations it would want to make. However, um, on this occasion, I've been made aware of a piece of work that's currently being worked on at the moment that will have a significant impact in this area um, and um, which would need to be included in the final report. But at this stage, the details can't be disclosed um, and therefore it would seem more appropriate for the panel to consider the conclusions and recommendations at a, at a, at a later stage and an additional meeting be arranged so that this information can be presented to members. However, in the interim period, obviously members are aware that um, in December there was an announcement um, about the Change in Futures scheme, um, which was launched by the government in December, um, a £46 million pound programme um, about aiming to establish new and innovative ways to better support vulnerable adults and particularly those facing entrenched disadvantage and trauma, which is really what we've heard about throughout the um, opioid dependency review. Um, and so members have expressed the view that prior to Christmas, it would be worth putting a local bid forward. Um, but obviously the timescales around that were quite tight with the um, the deadline for receipt of that being the 21st of January this year. Um, so Jonathan Bowden's here, obviously, from the public health team, and they have been working on that in the background. And we'd just like to give um, members a bit of an update in terms of what um what's going to be put forward as part of the bid and really to hear members views on on that as well if possible um and with your permission chair i'll hand over to jonathan on that if that's all yes please. yes please thank you chair thanks caroline thanks chair um yes it's um ni nice to be back again and um just to provide that update we've been um having discussions initially on a tease wide basis to see if it was feasible um to to do something there but um co the consensus was we didn't have enough of existing partnership work outside of maybe strategic meetings to to really evidence that there was a, a tease wide approach so we've gone with um a, a consensus to put it in on a south tease basis and around the uh, apologies I, sh I should have asked is it is it everyone is aware of of the background with change and futures from the from the previous meeting um or would it, would anyone just like a brief overview yes please yes yes please so, do as, as caroline said there's 46 million pounds of funding available and it's the ministry of housing communities and local governments who are leading on it um and there's also involvement from Home Office and Public Health England and, and one or two other government departments. And it's around tackling people facing multiple disadvantage and particularly around substance misuse, domestic abuse, mental health, homelessness um, and um, people who are also in contact with the criminal justice system. So the, um, the MHCLG are anticipating working with up to 15 local partnership areas and over the next two financial years, providing between one and a half and four and a half million pounds grants typically um, for the delivery. So the expression of interest is due in 
two days. Um, as Caroline mentioned, it is very tight timescales, as, as is usually the case. Um, so we've managed to to work together and, and pull together um, quite quite a um, a good a good um, case for for why South Tees should be um, considered and put through to the next stage. The next stage would give us around two months to pull together a um, proposal for a delivery plan, which is primarily what what would hinge on the final decision as to whether or not we're we're chosen. Um, so the it clearly aligns very much with the um, integrated service model that both Middlesbrough are implementing this April and Red Car and Cleveland will be implement implementing the following April. Um, we've got the South Tees Health and Wellbeing Board and the, the public health team that, that sits beneath that. We're both making every adult matter approach areas um, and we have a, a lot of um, delivery in common. Um, crucially, we've got the team around the individual panel, which meets on a South Tees wide basis and is very much um, looking at the sort of top of the pyramid of need in terms of, of this client group and as, as, as being a really good way of overcoming barriers and, and forging that collaboration uh, across South Tees. So we're, we're hanging the sort of bid on, on those elements to, to prove that South Tees um, it already has partnership work that can be built on, which is the first thing that they're going to look at with the expression of interest. Um, we're going, going to say that what the change in futures will allow is to really focus on those with unmet needs, those who don't really benefit from the existing system and, and tr try and find improved ways to, to engage those, um, th those cohorts. And then looking at recent evidence from needs assessments and, and existing DHRs and, and, the, and the team around the individual panel, et cetera. Um, the, the, the recurring cohorts that, that come up are the, the most extremely vulnerable um, females um, Obviously, that includes domestic abuse victims and, and all of those other other elements um, and transition groups. So people moving from um, young person services into adult services, prison releases, um, those who've suffered trauma um, in, in the early parts of their life um, and, and particularly those who are at the biggest risk of um, early death through suicide or drug related deaths. Um, so that they're the core groups, but what we want to make sure is that it's equitable so that it's not a postcode lottery as as some of the schemes have, have had to be due to capacity. Um, and that it, it regardless of any main topic area, be it substance misuse or homelessness, whatever the main um, sort of crisis issue is at the time, that everyone can have their needs looked at holistically. Um, as, as a result of this. So um, we, we would certainly increase our capacity um, right right across the, the area, um, work on a very much a trauma-informed principles um, basis as we will in both of our um, integrated models um, and do some um, additionality, things like personalization funds, which we've done in small pockets, which have proved to be very um, effective um, in overcoming barriers for individuals um, and then also innovation funds at more of a service level where if we if we identify needs that aren't being met um, with, within South Tees or barriers that, that require the system to adapt that there's a bit of um, that there's some funding available um, to, to do something about that be it a pilot or a, a different approach if there's an emerging evidence base so just basically creating the, the ability and, and the room to change either the whole system or more realistically some of the subsystems that sit beneath that. So we have managed to get all of the um, essential partners. Um, so it required local authorities uh, to be involved and, and a local authority to take the lead in terms of receiving and distributing the funding. Um, a political lead which um, Councillor Davison has, has kindly um, offered offered to do uh, be be the figurehead for that, um, and then all of our sort of statutory partners between health, police, criminal justice system. So every, we've managed to get everybody um, signed signed up to that. Um, this afternoon has been the cut off for um, people 
getting back to me with uh, with comments and in in a good way from the engagement side there's there's been a lot but obviously that translates into a bit of a challenge for me because it's very tight on word counts and trying to reflect all of the partnership um sort of elements w within that is is going to uh, is going to be a challenge but what what i propose to do is um obviously take feedback and questions and then um circulate the uh the sort of fi the final draft and the final bid um to to the panel um but we're we're in a good place we're, and confident that we can put a really good bid forward on thursday and i'll, I'll pause there if that's okay Jonathan, can i ask you what dhr means please sorry domestic homicide review sorry a domestic Domest homicide review homicide or homicide yes. homicide, homicide. Yes. homicide. So, Thank um you. we we've had a record a record number of drug related deaths domestic homicide review well domestic homicides which have led to the reviews um yeah. and and lot, lots of other of the sort of as i say the top the top of that pyramid in terms of the um the needs and the multiple disadvantages um and and how they manifest themselves thank you does anybody have any questions no sorry uh, i just have one Thanks, yes, yes yes um can i just ask when when i know it's you're saying the 21st he's going to put in for it and then he goes on to the next stage what sort of period of time are you looking over for this are we looking a few months before we know or is it going to be longer than that what sort of time no, it, gonna... it is going to be um a, a quick turnaround and um they've indicated that areas will find out if they've been successful at the eoi stage by next month and then um we we anticipate having um the the balance of, of february whenever we find out um and then march and potentially um some of april to, to give us that two months to pull together the um the next stage uh, but a, an important point that i should have uh, remembered um that but that's triggered it thanks is that we can get a grant of around fifteen thousand pounds to um help get some dedicated capacity to pull that together because although two months uh, sounds quite a lot given that given that it's going to be on a south tees basis with so many partner organizations um it'll really help to to pull that together that delivery plan and what, whatever whatever other elements they're ask for, asking for so presumably from that it, it, it when we get through to this so we get through to hopefully we get through to the next stage let's be confident um and then you've got in total the whole april may time when would you see this actually coming forward would you see it in the autumn when they make a decision or when do you actually see them make a final decision so we know if we've been successful with this one again they've indicated quite a, a quick turnaround because they want um as much of the next financial year to be used for um spending the money and and the delivery um so again i think that they're, to they're talking within uh, a month or two for the final decision even as well excellent thank you chair councillor how you wants to come in yes please chair thank you uh, just a few questions uh, practical in the nature of the type that david asked so you're quite confident just to get this right jonathan that we will get through this first stage that we're going to submit in um, on thursday on the 21st so actually the challenge is rather the next stage where we're going to get this extra funding to help us get this piece together and then you're going to circulate that to us and i'd be delighted to comment on it and see the um and i'm sure we all would it's welcome uh, my question then would be given that it's going to be quite a short turnaround and that we're hopefully going to get somewhere did i miss what you said about the amount of funding that might um come from a successful uh bid so could you just remind me of what you said please if you already said it no problem it's uh, they're, they're anticipating between one and a half and four and a half million pounds per partnership area that would cover the initial two-year period um and the, they've even indicated that the, there's discussions ongoing where they're hopeful it might even be extended beyond that two years um okay. from, from whenever the the sort of make the decision and we can commence um so yeah it's it's quite quite significant funding but i just check so i thought i thought you said that between one and a half and four and a half so the different authorities there'd be different amounts of money given to different areas dependent on their bids presumably is that what you're saying yes and very different different geography so, so ah. some some 
areas potentially could do it as a as a region or a sub region. Uh, and yes. then we're aware that um, other areas are looking at doing it just as a local authority bid. So I think that's why they've been quite broad uh, in the scale of, of what might be allocated. Oh, I understand. Thank you. That's clear, Chair. Thank you for that clarification, Jonathan. Thank, thank you. Anyone else has any questions before we say goodbye to Jonathan? No. Right. Thank you, Jonathan, very much for that. Um, I'm sure we'll see you again. Yes, um, thank you. Good night. Enjoy the rest of your evening, what's left of it. Thank you. And, um, Bye. Don't, don't go out painting the town red. You know, stay where <laughs> Absolutely you are. Absolutely not. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. Okay. Um, right. <laughs> Sorry. Seven, sorry, to... Yeah, sorry, Chair. So can we um can I just go back on uh, the opioid dependency? Are the members oh. happy for us to um arrange um a meeting between now and the next meeting in March to discuss um the, the, the additional information that needs to be presented? Um we'll send out a date for that. And in the interim period, if, if Jonathan circulates the bid, so members can have sight of that as well in advance of it being submitted once that's complete. Um, just to give a bit of a more of an indication of what's in, what's included in that. Um, would, would, that, not, would, that not, would that not be included in our next meeting? No. Um, it could be done in that way. It was just a suggestion that perhaps you... Um, I don't know whether members would want to see it before it's actually submitted as opposed to after it's I'm, submitted. I'm, I'm easy. Whatever, whatever members want. Do they want to wait until the next meeting or do they want to bring it uh, as soon as it's available? Chair, I think it'd be nice to see it as soon as you possibly can. I think most members of the committee would would agree with that. Fine, fine. Do you want to comment or add something? Or yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, we'll arrange for that to be circulated, and then um, and, I'll, and we'll also get a date with Jonathan because he'll give the presentation on the information as well that needs to be updated in terms of okay, fine. Got. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Caroline. So, agenda item number seven. You wanted to give the report. Sorry, Chair. Did you hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry, Chair. Um, just one moment, sorry. Um, sorry, we've been getting a new committee management system, so all of our um, mm -hmm. papers are completely different on the, on the screen. Sorry. So, yeah, the overview and scrutiny board update. Obviously, it was just to advise um, to members on um, what happened at the recent overview and scrutiny board meetings. The 18th of December meeting, that was in relation to the call-ins. Um, there was a first call in about Nunthorpe Grange um, and the disposal of that, but um, there was some further legal advice required on that, so that meeting had to be reconvened. That's now set up to take place on the 29th of January, so that meeting will be going ahead then. The other was on the, um, the re residual waste, but that decision was since reversed by executives, mm -hmm. so there was no need for that, to, for that meeting to go ahead because it couldn't actually go ahead on the day because of technical reasons. And then we also had OSB on the 14th of January. There were a few different items on that agenda. Um, there was a COVID update from Tony and from Mark and from Jeanette Savage as well, which provided some quite detailed information in respect of um, the financial support that's been offered to businesses. Um, it was a really interesting presentation and obviously that's available online for members to watch if they'd like to watch that. Um, and there were also, it was also the update on the Tees Safeguarding, um, Tees Wide Safeguarding Adult Board. Um, their annual report and priorities for next year, which again makes for very interesting reading, is obviously relevant to this panel as well. Um, and then it was just um, an update from the chairs, the ones that had met on that. That's great. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, did you speak, Alma? I just wanted to say, all through this uh, aspect of the meeting tonight, when we were talking about the impact of um, public health and policy issues, in my head all the time was this issue about the um, the collection of the refuse on a fortnightly basis because I kept thinking, wow, that's a really good example of public health and policies. You know, that one area of the environment is linking over into public health because of all the uh, impact of fewer collections of refuse on some of our communities. Just one that we could take as a case study for how to hammer home the public health issue. Right, agenda item number eight. Um, shall I say finally? Because I'm about, I'm tired. I don't know about anybody else. Um, any other business, and I don't think we have any. All right. Okay. And the next doesn't have the next meeting is Tuesday, the sixteenth of February. 
So can I all thank you all for turning up, including the members who have uh, left us now. Um, look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Um, and good night and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.